get started. Um, thank you, first of all, for making it over here um, in the midst of the just gorgeous weather we're having today. Um, my name is Jenny. I'm the manager of creative and educational technology at the Arary Library based on this campus. Um, and today I thought we'd talk a little bit about incorporating media and technology based projects into courses. Um, so any kind of non traditional assignment um, and mostly as we'll get to kind of what library services I might be able to help you do that. So Oh, to let you know, just from the get go, um, all these slides, because some of them, there are links there uh, so that you can get the information on some of our resources. Uh, it is all available at that tinyurl.com slash CTC hyphen symposium hyphen 2017. Um, so give me a second to write that. It's on one of the closing slides too. Um, so my initial thought um, is to talk a little bit about the initial questions maybe that you could ask yourself in considerations if you'd like to incorporate project-based learning or non-traditional assignments into your course kind of to, to get a framework and get started um, then what is the library creative technology commons for one um, and how can it help uh, as i hope that it can and then some very general best practices for structuring a project into your course um, whether that's an online or in-person course so that's actually probably a good question to start with is who in here teaches online if maybe teaches online potentially also in person okay so does anyone teach only online at this time okay um and does anyone do you guys are you already incorporating project-based or non-traditional media into some of your assignments who is right right now there's one of your classes that has something in it okay great what kind of stuff if i could ask Okay. Gotcha. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah, and that's, that, that's a pro tip right there as well. Like this could actually make your lives a little more fun and, and easier, at least interesting, because um, you get kind of that mix of, of content. Okay, great. A lot of you probably are too. I mean, a, a presentation even, you know, things, there's ways that even things that we think of as pretty normal in the classroom, presentations, papers, um, there's, you know, ways to kind of amp them up and get at some of what, what's helpful about um, more project-based learning or, or non-traditional assignments. But, to start with then, I guess, since, since some of us are new to it, kind of like why a technology or media-based project, because um, as has already kind of been noted, it actually can be a little more difficult for students. That can actually be a great thing. Um, it can get them some professional skills as well. Um, but what, you know, what's important about it? And I'm assuming since you guys are here, some of you already have some thoughts about it. Uh, the couple things that for me, always come up um, or just it, it being multimodal, right? So it's really easy to accommodate different learning styles um, because in a lot of cases, a single project actually is probably going to incorporate different types of learning, different types of research um, than students might already be used to. Another one is just that this is what surrounds us, right? We encounter media in all kinds of different forms. Um, I'm not sure we're always great at teaching students, you know, as they grow up, even through primary and secondary school, kind of how to parse it, how to analyze it. Um, but if you're doing some kind of project, and we'll get it, you know, some of the details of what that could look like, um, in, in the end, you're a creator, right? You're creating some kind of media form or, um, you know, some object. And so in that process, you encounter all of the decisions that everyone, you know, in industry or on the news or anywhere else is encountering as they're putting content out there, whether it's articles, blog posts, videos. Um, and so that starts to build a certain literacy. You know, they see what the difference is. If they make a video and they put really dramatic, um, maybe heart-wrenching music behind it versus, you know, more upbeat tone, just, you know, with the music alone, they see what the different impact that has. Um, and that starts to click when then you're encountering media, whether it is the news, whether it's anywhere in their lives of, oh, you know, someone made this, there was a decision made that's trying to do something, right? Influence me in a certain way um, or teach me or whatever it is. Um, and so you start to be a smarter consumer and smarter, um, kind of savvier appreciator of media, which 
needed, let's say, in today's, <laughs> today's world above all. Um, and then kind of lastly is it, it just works. Um, I mean, there, there's a lot more research about this coming out of primary and secondary schools in the university context, but all of it across the board um, in, in kind of all its forms and all the places that they've tried it is um, you see higher levels of content mastery actually, you know, assessment wise, um, as well as self reports by the students of being more engaged or of understanding the material better. Um, gains in research skills and some of these other sort of soft skills or, or other pieces that might get incorporated into the project process that don't always get incorporated into normal kind of classroom. Um, so this is all kind of great to know, uh, but I'm not sure that it really helps us with coming up with a project for your course, right? It's kind of right, this, this sounds really good. Um, for me, it really, it sounds kind of general, but we'll, we'll walk through it. There's one question that I think helps start to structure a sort of framework um, for how and what kind of projects to incorporate into um, a given course online or in person. And that's pretty much just this. What might my students need to do in their futures? Professionally, academically, you know, research-wise or something, personally, civically. Um, and so it can take a lot of forms. It might be, you know, what did you wish you had known about your field when you graduated that you didn't? Um, or even that, you know, you had to do a lot of your own training maybe in recent years to get up to speed on something um, that you'd like to give that to your students. Um, sorry, I went a little bit too far. Also just kind of like what in your field gets you excited? You know, what's out there? Um, why do you teach even besides you know the, the obvious fame glory and riches you know like what what are you in this for sometimes it's a civic question um but all of those things can actually start to help us sort of structure what we might look at for projects and then the piece where the library and creative technology commons fits in is hopefully a way that we can kind of um help help get you there without requiring too much time i went too fast to start with and now it's you Okay, so pricing that out a little bit. Um, this, you know, it can be down to the really granular and technical, right? So like maybe your students, um, people in your field are gonna need to use a specific technology, um, specific, specific software, specific maybe workflow. Um, and you know, that can be a good starting point for the, the type of project that you incorporate. Maybe you expect just in, in the kind of careers they're going into, they're gonna need to make a website at some point um, or make a video or do a pitch presentation and launch a Kickstarter. Um, and so all those are kind of things we could think about. But then we can get into some kind of more general soft skills too. Um, giving effective presentations, more or less universal. Um, you know, cooperating with the team. And then some of these information and data literacy bits. So knowing what sources to trust. Um, being, as we kind of talked about before, a savvy consumer of media in different ways um, or, or of data. Um, and just interpreting data and information from the point of sort of finding it and analyzing it and understanding where it's coming from, maybe out to, you know, what's important about it and how can I kind of get that across. Um, it's not an accident that a lot of these end up falling into some of the bigger categories that we like to talk about too, right? Like media literacy and, and digital literacies and data literacies. Um, and projects are a really great way to start looking at uh, kind of all of those things and getting your students involved in them. Okay, so it still sounds like we're at a pretty broad level, but actually you already have a starting point, right? So that thing that like, why am I doing this? What's important? What do my students need to know? That, that's pretty much your learning objective. That's your goal. Um, and then you already had content, right? You're teaching a course. So you, there's certain material that you wanted to cover. Um, and sort of thinking through those and how those fit together and what's the most effective way to get your students working at that learning objective and just using your content as kind of the material. Um, is really that next step. And that's sort of the secret to the whole thing. I mean, content can be explored in one of any number of ways. Um, and so just this first step of kind of figuring out how will be helpful for then us structuring that into a course um, and then finding, you know, what resources on campus, hopefully including at the library, um, could be helpful to you for it. So I, it's kind of, I mean, I kind of like to do it. It's like sort of a Mad Lib sort of thing. Um, you know, you have to say analyze from here, but we could substitute in, you know, any type of class, any type of learning objective, there's gonna be things in common across them and maybe some projects that really make sense. If you want students to be able to analyze the news and analyze video media and things, 
then yeah, having them work in video is probably a good idea. Um, but then there's pieces of this that you guys are the experts on, right? Like, you know, within your field, how they would get it, maybe a general skill that's important. Um, so, okay, maybe our history students, maybe they're thinking they might be curators. Um, so curating an exhibition and maybe they're writing proposals and developing that. Um, if we substitute out still the art history class, but now you want them to promote their work, I, I don't know exactly what that looks like in art history or what some of the careers that come out of that look like. Um, maybe it does involve them demoing up and mocking up posters of some kind. Um, maybe it's some kind of you know networking within the field. And if we substituted art history for biochem, yeah, they still might be interested in promoting their work. Now it's probably gonna look different, right? It's gonna have to do with how to promote you know, scholarly research, um, network within their field. Um, and so you can start to kind of pinpoint the specifics that work for your discipline. Um, but that overall kind of framework gives you at least that starting point of figuring out what makes sense. And some of these two, so data visualizations, equally applicable to sociology and biochemistry, even though the data you're looking at might look different, right? Um, and maybe some things about the way you present it might look different, but some of the skills or some of the software or some of the things you might use could be the same. Okay, so great, great still, I think, maybe in theory. Um, obviously, it's not always quite, quite that simple. Um, a couple of things that I hear come up a lot at this point, or even once you've kind of figured out a project, are, are these kind of pain point factors. So the class time that it would take to teach these skills, whether it's online course, in person, whether you're doing it in class or as an assignment, in any case, like your course is already probably pretty full. How are you gonna add this thing into it? The expertise required for maybe that type of creation. We all kind of grew up writing papers when we're doing research, so we're pretty good at that. But if you wanted them to make an infographic or make a data visualization, that, that might be a skill set you have. It might be a skill set that you're gonna have to somehow take the time to learn. Um, actually, you won't, that's sort of <laughs> why I'm here, hopefully, um, as a starting point, but that's something that comes up a lot. And then the unknowns about assessment um, for the untraditional assignment, same kind of thing. We have a sense of how to structure assessment um, for maybe more traditional projects, um, but you know, how, how do we take a look at that? So I, I put this, so we're sure we're all kind of on the same page of like, I know it's not magic, but let's not think about those for one more second still. Um, what, like, what are you guys curious about? Are there projects um, that you're, you're interested in incorporating in your classes? And we heard from one person who's already kind of incorporating something. Um, I think, let's see what time we're at. We probably won't like break out and do this, um, but if anyone wants to just shout out if, if you have ideas, if you don't, then we can talk through PPC stuff. Is there, has anyone thought about like incorporating video into a class? A couple people? Yeah, so we'll get into a little bit of the details on sort of the software side of what, what we cover. Um, in general, the library learning spaces um, at the CTC or Creative Technology Commons uh, are all set up as kind of learning opportunities. So we don't do much on the side of like service, like you come and we do it for you. Um, but we would sort of walk you through the process of how to do it. Um, and then we're also available basically as a resource for students too, so that if you did assign one of these projects, they could come in. Um, and get one-on-one -on -one support in a number of different ways. Um, and so specifically about the interactive video, we'll, we'll talk because there, there is one thing that we support that kind of ties into that a little bit. Okay, so I saw some, some video. Are people thinking like infographics, data visualizations, poster, a little less of that stuff? Just have a sense of kind of what services we kind of talk through. Yeah, yeah. I think it's worth it then in the morning 
I think that's a great idea. The, the other thing I'd add is a lot of times students, you know, they're, they're viewing media all the time, whether it is like the infographics they see in the news, um, videos that they see everywhere, basically. And so a lot of times they go into it with a, a stronger idea of kind of what they are expecting themselves to produce and kind of what they want their end result to be, um, which can be a huge motivating factor as well of putting in maybe a little more work and definitely more time um, that we'll talk about than maybe they normally would on a paper because they're sort of driven by that end result that's sort of already in their mind that they want to see. Um, so there's kind of the rewarding process of actually, you know, going through it and making it and doing it. Um, but a lot of times you, you're also sort of helped by the fact that they have a little maybe more 
initial motivation to start too, because they have something tangible, at least in their head. Um, I mean, I'm gonna move along just so we can get to how hopefully we can help you with um, putting this into your classes. Um, so again, those, those kind of pain points, time, expertise, and assessment, um, big pieces of what we see. Uh, and of course, there isn't a magic cure for like, yep, like we'll do away with all of those and you can just do this and it's gonna be great um, and simple. Um, but we are trying to minimize, I, I guess, kind of the, well, the time. Um, your specific expertise kind of offloads some of the technical maybe and workflow expertise um, onto, in our case, the library, although there's all kinds of other resources on campus for different things. Um, and then we'll, we'll sort of address assessment. Uh, so uh, the, next, the next couple of steps, we'll kind of walk through some resources um, and then maybe some kind of general best practices um, that, that you can have in mind um, if you do incorporate a project into your class. So I don't know, some of you aren't on this campus. Um, even those of you, you that are, I don't know how recently you've been to the library. Um, definitely stop by if it's been a while. We're just finishing up a six year renovation. Um, so it may look a little different than last time you were in there. Um, besides some of the more service-based um, resources that I'm gonna talk about, we're also just kind of a space for students to meet. Um, you know, centrally located on campus. Um, we have pretty long hours uh, during the summer. We're open 7.30 to nine um, during the school year. It's extended beyond that um, for, that's like a Monday to Thursday. Uh, and then slightly limited hours the rest of the time. Um, we have, there's bookable group study rooms that people can meet if they're doing like a group project. Um, they can reserve them out and meet in there. Um, and then we have a number of other resources uh, that, that we'll be getting into. So one of the big additions to, um, well, that's happened in the renovation has been the addition of our creative technology commons. Um, so this is a suite of learning spaces based around uh, kind of hands-on work with different types of creative technologies. Um, all of the spaces I'm about to talk about are open to faculty, staff, and students. So we'll look at them a little bit in the context of projects in your classes that we might be able to help your students one-on-one -on -one with, um, but, there, but also some pieces that might help you regardless of what you're doing, um, preparing content for your own class uh, or trying to get you know, students trained in, in different things. So one of our older ones is the discovery wall. Um, we'll focus on this a little less today, um, but know that it's there for you. Um, basically, it's a, a large visualization wall um, and any class or student group or some other organizations uh, can rent it out, basically book it out. Um, and so if you were doing a presentation based project, you can get kind of like a TEDx style sort of feel. There's a giant screen that runs off a Windows computer. So PowerPoint files or PDF or anything are fine. Um, we have microphones, all different kinds of peripherals. Um, so students can kind of have that environment um, to be presenting work in. We do hear from faculty all the time that the average quality of student work goes up when, when students know they're in the sort of public space um, because it is right in the heart of our library and, and you get kind of passerby traffic. Um, so we've hosted, you know, digital storytelling and video screenings um, from projects and classes, presentations, you know, capstone um, work and things, things like that. Um, and then the rest of the time it, it serves as a showcase of what's going on on campus. Um, and so you can submit that too, yeah. We're kind of working on it. I mean, it is set up that if you had a camera or a webcam, there's sort of an area in the back that would work well for that. Um, we're looking into trying to find, you know, getting a, a sort of easier way that you can just get it to record. Um, so hopefully soon. Um, and then our design studio, and don't be fooled by the word design. Uh, we didn't use the word media because we want to differentiate it from another center that's located in our same building. Um, but it's anything kind of at that intersection of communication, media, design, technology. Um, and so we'll talk about some of the specifics, but for certainly like the video projects that sounded like some people were interested in, um, and maybe in general um, for a lot of the, the types of projects you might incorporate into a class, this would probably going to be a good resource. Uh, this semester, we've added a 3D printing and scanning space, um, the Make Lab. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And then in spring of 2018, uh, so about a year from now, um, we're expecting um, a fourth space to be on board, uh, which is our innovation garage. So a more kind of free form collaborative space um, designed for kind of group, group work, but also hands on making and maybe like a little bit of a messier way than <laughs> the rest of the library can accommodate. Um, so maybe basic, you know, 
power and hand tools, um, soldering irons, pop-up workshops, and you know, Internet of Things or sensors or those types of things. But that one's not quite quite yet. Okay, so that the CTC kind of design space. Um, in terms of services, and we'll talk about like how you access these services, like what that looks like in a little bit, because they tend to apply to actually almost all of our library resources. Um, but, but the kind of specialties of this area um, and this space are basic video production, um, digital storytelling assignments, uh, basic editing, um, audio recording and editing. And so that's great, you know, potentially for within your class, um, but also maybe for yourselves if you are creating uh, videos and you needed some hands on um, with doing the editing piece, um, we're there to support you for that. Maybe you recorded it at the CU Online Creation Station, um, which I think some of you were in the room for that last session, um, you know, and you wanted just a little bit more hands on with the editing or, you know, add some narration over it after the fact or something, um, we can help you with those pieces as well as doing kind of more direct help um, to your student if you are incorporating a project like this. We have a little photography studio in there. So any class, if you're making something and want to document that, whether you formally put it into ePortfolio form or website or um, just want students to have this high quality documentation of their work, uh, we have a space for that. Students can reserve it out. This and, and all of these things always come with staff support there to help them hands on. Um, so it's fine if they've never touched the camera before. We'll get them set up with the lighting, set up with kind of everything to get the documentation they're looking for. Um, digitization and compression. I just, I've heard a little bit today that uh, even though this may be fixed in the future uh, on kind of the Canvas side, um, people have encountered issues of uploading video into Canvas and it being too big. Um, there's free compression software that can help with that. Um, and if you just wanted, uh, the, the main software is called Handbrake, um, hand and then break like you would break a car. Um, but if you wanted to kind of walk through the process, we'd be happy to do that there. Research poster design, or really poster design, I mean design in general, um, presentation design. Um, and we have an at cost large format printing service over there too. And just look at some of the specific software. Um, so we do basic support in Adobe Creative Cloud in general. Um, Adobe Acrobat Pro, I just added this today because if any of you were at the accessibility workshop, if you did need a way to uh, get that OCR, um, optical, optical character recognition version of PDF, so it is accessible. Um, we have a pro version of that software that will do that. You can scan in a PDF and it will usually do a pretty good job of, of getting that in accessible form. Um, Camtasia, so turning to the interactive video question, um, CU Online is, uh, well, there's Canvas integration already for TechSmith Relay, which lets you do interactive video. Um, and then they're adding this whole sort of suite of access to Camtasia uh, starting July 1st. And it's access to Camtasia and Snagit, is that right, Amy? Um, so, so soon you'll have access just to Camtasia, which is instructional design software that lets you kind of make interactive videos, but also add in, you know, arrows and call outs and things within video. Um, but we also provide support for that. So if you need it, just kind of, you know, one-on-one -on -one help as you're working through something um, or just kind of an overall introduction, we can do that. Uh, same thing for PowerPoint and Prezi, iMovie, um, and we're, we're adding another option um, cross-platform called Filmora, we think, um, and Audacity audio editing. Um, and just, I have this at the end, but we'll sort of switch back, yeah. Are any of those tools that you had just listed available uh, if you're not dealing with the Odd on campus version? None of them are sort of available through us. Um, something, you know, so like Camtasia, for example, is going to be available through just kind of CU, thanks to CU Online. Um, some of them, you know, different, uh, Phil Morris, say, let's go back a little bit. Uh, iMovie, you know, comes on. Apple computers, Filmora, uh, you can download a free version that just has some different restraints on it. Um, but but nothing is sort of like you could sort of like log in through the library at this time and access it. Yeah, at this time, um, I think, yeah. We have a few other computers within the library labs where it's available. So if we're just you need to access it kind of outside our hours, um, it's there, but but no kind of login form for it. Um, and 
so just since I'm kind of talking around it, how, so with any of those, the software, so part of it's just software access, right? Um, and so especially maybe in your online class, if your students are local enough that they could come to us, you could be sort of rest assured that they have access to the software, either through the general library labs um, or through our space. Um, but in addition for any of those, uh, so we can do kind of like one-on-one -on -one consultations uh, with you about kind of, you know, incorporating into the class, one-on-one um, -on -one training for the software. Um, and that includes also just drop in support. So all of those spaces um, it's on the library website have just regular drop in hours um, that people can come, whether it's faculty or again, your students uh, come in with the project and just be working on it there so that as questions come up, um, we can kind of help answer them. Uh, we do host regular workshops um, and can do that also uh, by request as an instruction session for the class. So let's say that you did want to have a video project in your course. Um, you could just have us come in and maybe do like an initial overview of the process or maybe some specific software or something that you want them to work with um, to sort of offload that side of the expertise from you. you know, like we'll kind of handle that part and then your students can come in for the one-on-one -on -one support as they need as well. Um, and this stuff is actually true for things beyond the creative technology commons as well. Um, so instruction sessions uh, for just like our data management and research help and kind of database access um, services that our other librarians offer. Um, all of that is also available by request for a class. Um, they'll do it online as needed too, as much as we can accommodate. Um, and the same thing, like we're hosting kind of regular workshops uh, that I'll get to in one second um, within the library as well. A final thing and maybe especially helpful for the online course piece is um, pretty much all of our services and, and any of the kind of topic based inquiry that we try to support at the library. We really try to build out our online resources for that as well. Um, so that we have these research guides and you can search all of them um, at guides.averia.edu. They're also linked from the library website. Um, but in kind of each of these, you know, there's a digital storytelling research guide that kind of walks through the process. Um, you know, in kind of tutorial format. Uh, and there's a research poster design guide, as well as more specific maybe subject guides for how to access different types of resources um, in that area. So just an example of one set of workshops. And I know, I think all the sessions have been going a little bit over <laughs> today, um, but we are kind of at times, so if anyone did want to make sure that they like secure their place um, upstairs, feel free to head out, I won't be offended at all. Um, but if you want to hang out, we'll, we'll go through just a couple other resources within the library that I hope can be helpful. Okay, um, so back to that kind of access question, because um, that, that can be an issue. If you are assigning a project, making sure that your students actually have access to maybe not just the support help, but the actual resources um, to be able to fulfill it. Um, and so for a lot of things, I mean, media production in general, right? Like if they have a smartphone, um, which isn't any of them, but it is a lot of our students, um, that that's already might be sufficient for the type of you know, video work um, that they're doing. The most important thing is kind of getting them involved, even if it's not the highest resolution quality. Um, but we at our Ask Us Center, kind of at the front of the library, um, do have, laptops um, with kind of basic, their Windows laptops with basic software on them. Um, headset microphones, so if your students were doing an audio podcast or recording narration over a video, um, we can help them at the CTC and we have those headset microphones over there too. Um, but they could also just check it out on their own um, and, and do that. Um, basic point and shoot cameras um, and Wi-Fi hotspots. So if for any of your students accessing the internet is an issue, um, we actually piloted through this last year and um, we'll be continuing a checkout program for Wi-Fi um, so that again, maybe especially for online learning, um, you can be absolutely sure that they have access regularly um, since that's the main way they're interacting with the class, but really with anyone if you're expecting them to do research at home, um, have that for checkout. And then our people, besides the fact that we're very friendly over at the library, um, we do have expertise there uh, that you might not expect. Um, these are just a few of the positions we've added within the last year or so, um, but hopefully building out, you know, some resources uh, and real expertise that can be helpful in exactly this type of process of crafting, you know, project projects within um, your coursework in all kinds of different ways. And, and sort of forms depending um, on what's useful within your discipline. Um, also see you online. I mean, I think everyone kind of knows this, but amazing resource on kind of the pedagogy side, especially for 
um, online ways of structuring maybe the course for online work um, and some of the tools you could use there. In particular, one piece um, that I didn't hear brought, get brought up kind of throughout the day yet today, um, but Amy Ossetinsky from CU Online is working, uh, it, it came out of sort of this workshop um, through Pam Laird, uh, but on uh, developing tools for using social media in the classroom. Um, and so this is kind of one area that the library probably won't necessarily be moving into just because it is um, a little bit guided by institutional policies um, and, and we serve all three schools on this campus so aren't always you know the best for knowing the specific policies um, and most up to date for CU versus for Metro versus for CCD um, but these guys are developing that and so if you're interested either on the particip participatory level um, or you know with your own experience um, getting in, in touch with her would be great. Um, and very kind of last thing on our resources side, um, please tell it, like if you are thinking about a project and you have this great idea in mind and nothing of what I've said sounds applicable or useful to it, please let us know. I mean, all of these spaces and services are so new um, that we're really enthusiastic about getting input um, from campus on what is useful. Um, and so whether that is specific types of software, um, to access within our space, uh, or maybe potentially, if possible, remotely, um, or certainly, you know, ways that we can help and be there for either you directly or students. Um, we we really want to know about it. All right, so I don't want to make everyone late to lunch. Um, a couple of last things I was going to go through. Uh, you can get there a little bit more sort of self-explanatory, and there's some notes on that online version um, of this presentation. Um, it really comes down to incorporating a little bit of the guidance for a project um, and also guidance of what students can expect in terms of the time expenditure because it is more time consuming to create media-based projects than um, a paper in many cases or, or than what they think. Um, so setting expectations about that um, and what they should reasonably expect um, and how you'll be grading, you know, because it's new to them as well. Um, and of course, with that sort of like incorporating that guidance, that's exactly what we're here for at the library. So you don't have to be the one to do that overview of how to make a video or how to approach designing an infographic. Um, we'd be happy to come in uh, or we can direct you to our online resources that you can direct your students to uh, on, you know, sort of getting started with that. Whichever pieces are important to you, data management side, the actual creation side, um, kind of any of those. And likewise, in terms of assessment is kind of the one piece we didn't get to talk about. Um, but we mentioned that, you know, project-based learning tends to involve a number of different pieces. Um, and so this is also another way that this can almost become easier within the overall structure of your course. Having each of those be these kind of mini deadlines um, can help students, first of all, make sure that they're staying on track with what, what all needs to happen to get to that final stage. Um, it adds kind of a relevance and immediacy to grading and assessment. Um, and then also ends up usually with kind of better quality work at the end because they actually have gone thoughtfully through each of the stages. Um, so, you know, checking in at the topic selection stage or um, at the, you know, data, like finding the data source you're working with and data interpretation before you ever get to the visualization sides um, in whatever form makes sense going back to kind of the earlier like learning objectives and goals. Maybe it's through a blog post, maybe it's through a video that you're actually checking in on. Um, and these kinds of things, I mean, they, it, it varies very much based on exactly kind of what your aim is um, for that course and what media you're working with. Um, but this is all stuff we'd be happy to talk through with you. I know CU Online folks um, in terms of incorporating into instruction could as well. Um, so, Take a picture of that slide if you are left with questions since we did go a little bit over. Um, the presentation URL there. Um, and our library website has all information about the specific spaces, hours, resources available there. Um, and we'll also post up there the informational cards about each of those spaces. So if you wanted just something really quick that you could link in your LMS um, so that students know where they can go for the hands-on support, uh, you can either email me directly and I'll send those out to you. Uh, or those should be up, I think, within the week um, on the website for each of the spaces. So you can download sort of the information about that design studio space, 
just to give directly to your students, um, the 3D space, all of those kinds of things. So thank you again. Um, and yeah, happy to answer questions afterward at lunch, you know, anytime throughout kind of the day. Thanks.